Hi, Hugh. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Um, of course. I start every episode with a, a, a question, but we're going to move this question to the end of the episode because I know there's a lot to unpack here. But, you know, basically, what does it mean to be Vietnamese? And hopefully we're going to unpack that as we go along in this mm -hmm. episode. So what um, what year did, were you born in the United States or did you come as a baby or? Um, so I, I was born in um, in the 80s. I'm not going to like give away my real age. A woman never does. But yes, born like in the 80s, um, my parents um, were boat people. And so they came here um, in the middle of the night. Well, so they were boat people. And so they... Um, came to first Indonesia. And so that was actually where I was born. And I think that has kind of really um, influenced the way I've thought about my life, you know, like for me, like I wasn't born in, with a silver spoon in my mouth, like I was born in a freaking refugee camp. And that kind of like, yeah, has influenced how I think about things and how, you know, I never take um, anything for granted. And so they were in the refugee camp for about a year and then went to Hong Kong. And that's where they got the green light to come over to America. And of all of the places that they could have ended up, at was in this small southern town called Waycross, Georgia, and it was a group of um, church people who um, sponsored us over. And coincidentally, my parents still live here after almost 30, 40 years, and I keep um, coming back. So, yeah. How far yeah. is that from Atlanta? It is, um, it is about four hours from Atlanta. So, uh, so I like to say for people who haven't been to Georgia, like there's, there's Atlanta and then there's the rest of Georgia, which is so completely different. different. When they moved to, uh, to that small town, mm -hmm. you're, you're an infant, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up um, all my life um, in this small town, and we were literally like only a handful of um, Vietnamese families there. So growing up, I never really had, um, you know, a sense of a Vietnamese, Vietnamese community. And so that wasn't until like later as an adult that I experienced that. Wow. So. Did your parents sort of hang out with the other Vietnamese families? Um, um, they did, you know, out of like, out of necessity, you know, but, um, a lot of those families have, um, uh, moved away to Texas, to California. And, um, my parents are literally the only remaining ones left. And, you know, and there's a story in that, there's a documentary in that, that I've been, um, wanting to, um, unpack for a couple years now. So. Why do you think they stayed there and not moved to a bigger community of Vietnamese people? You know, I think it, it comes from maybe um, from trauma, like having, you know, risked their lives to move from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they can they would ever want to take that risk anymore, because even here um, it it's like pulling teeth to try to get my parents to, you know, to contribute to Atlanta. And because I live in LA, like, um, I think it would take a lot of convincing for them to even get on a plane to come visit me. Oh, so, they never did. They haven't been yeah. to LA or Orange Yeah, County. they haven't, yeah. Not even to Orange County? No, they haven't. The, the last time they went to, they were on a plane was um, actually to my, um, to my wedding in San Francisco. That was, and that was um, like five years ago. So that was the last time they've yeah. been on a plane. So when you're growing up, right, you're growing up mm -hmm. in Georgia and I can, that's like one of the white uh, states that you can grow up in. Yeah. How, what, can you describe that? 
it was you know like like now like I think being in it you don't realize how different it is it isn't until you step out of it and then you look at it you know in hindsight and it's, it was like wow we went through a lot you know like um I'm kind of working on a couple of stories about growing up in um yeah in this small southern town and like digging up those memories and and it was hard I remember being in um, elementary school and being placed in speech therapy classes um, just because they didn't know what to do with me because it wasn't that I had a speech impediment it was just I didn't know how to speak English and so I should have been in ESL classes you know and then there were all these other like little microaggressions and a lot of you know, you don't look like you belong around here, you know, and, and I mean, I think I still always felt Vietnamese. I still, uh, because at home I would have to speak um, Vietnamese to my parents so I wouldn't be able to communicate. And so, um, so I'm glad I have, I have that, you know, the language at least. So. So when you're growing up, you know, I think, um, CNN is out of Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. Did that mm -hmm. have anything to do with you wanting to become uh, somebody working in the uh, that business? Um, growing up, I always wanted to be like an artist. Like I, I drew a lot in um, high school, and I wrote a lot. I wasn't on my um, newspaper in high school or anything like that the thought the idea of journalism as a career as a career didn't even um didn't even register but i knew that um if i wanted to get out of my like small town trappings then the only option would was kind of atlanta so and cnn was kind of like the only option if i wanted to um be in journalism just because you know the mono myth minority we have to be at the best and so cnn is literally you know the best i think news organization yeah. out there so what was your journey like to get there um like you know like i've said like growing up i never ever thought i would um be in journalism. I mean, I knew I wanted to do something creative, but at the same time, I knew I wanted, I needed to do something that was secure and could pay the bills, you know. And um, so I went to Emory University. Um, I majored in creative writing to um, kind of, you know, satisfy that creative side and then double majoring in journalism to satisfy, you know, my parents' side. And so, um, so I majored in journalism and it was with the help of the Asian American Journalists Association. Mm -hmm. They helped me get a scholarship. Um, and it was kind of easy because, you know, there aren't really that many Asians majoring in journalism anyways. And so they were just like, Do you want a scholarship? And so I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, um, and so then that kind of like, was like, oh, I could, you know, graduate and get into this field. And at the awards banquet was where I had it in my head. I was like, I'm going to meet someone who's going to give me an internship at CNN. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, I met someone and she was, and she kind of became my mentor. And she was like, yeah, uh, you can become my intern because, you know, I, it wasn't until later that I found out that getting an internship at CNN was like really, really hard. And so that organization gave me like wow. a foot in the door and like i'm forever thankful for that god i'm having goosebumps just yeah. gratitude you know yeah organizations like that and many times those organizations are put together by people with such high ideals to forward the sort of the the, mm -hmm. the community right and it pays off it pays i mean it shows right like and was that woman who gave you the internship was she asian 
Yeah, she was uh, Vietnamese too. Um, her name was uh, Kim Boy, and at the and I think at the time, and I think she still is like the highest ranking um, Asian American um, there at CNN. So to have access to her like that, um, yeah, is is amazing. And even now, like when I, I'm now on the board of the Asian American Journalist Association in LA, and I was. Um, the uh, member of the year last year too. So I've, you know, I've given back because they've given me so much. So Kim Bowie, you meet there, right? And this mm -hmm. is your first year in college or how far along in college are you? Pretty late. This is, um, um, I interned there my senior year. So I was kind of like really scrambling, like trying to figure out what I wanted to do mm -hmm. with my life. <laughs> So you meet Kim Bowie, she's like, okay, come intern with me. What is that mm -hmm. like? You just email her back like, hey, I'm here, I'm ready to go. And then she's like, all right, well, come in. Can you tell me about like sort of that process? Yeah, so um, it's still a formal process, but the fact that, you know, she had my name, she could, um, and I went through like applications and everything, but because she had my name, she could, um, she contacted, you know, the internship coordinator and said, um, Hugh, I um, pick her out, she's going to be working with me. And yeah, so that's, yeah, that's how that worked. Yeah. So, so then she very for it. Yeah. So you come and you work for her and what is it that she what did she do at the time at mm -hmm. CNN, and what did you do for her as an intern? Yeah. So she is the um executive producer of the special projects team at CNN and so they handle a lot of um what we would call now branded um branded content. They worked alongside with the marketing. So whenever like sales and marketing would bring in sponsors, then they would create um, content that would then be um, branded, um, like sponsored by, um, you know, Chevrolet or some company like that. And so they were very, I think ahead of the curve on that, you know. Um, and so I would help with research and I was also given opportunities to write scripts as well. And by the end of that um, year long sponsorship, I had completed um, three produced packages that I could put on my reel in order to show um, other companies once I graduated. So, and so to have, you know, to say, as a college graduate to have a reel that into, includes things that you've already produced for CNN puts you even more ahead of the pack, yeah. and yeah. and that helped tremendously so mm -hmm. so then after you graduate do you do you sort of just become part of the CNN team do they just take you in um, so I after I graduated I um, there I, with news, you know, you always have to like start at the bottom and work your way up. And so I um, landed a news trainee program at a local, local station in um, in Atlanta. And so, and I worked with the marketing and promotions um, department. And so they would make like the commercials and they would make um, the promos for the, for on air and everything. And so that um, that training program lasted for 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 about a year, and then um, after that, um, I applied for um, the CNN video journalist program, and so that is their kind of like entry level position for anyone who wants to you know work at CNN, and um, a video journalist is someone who um, at the time we had um, they kind of help like floor direct and kind of act as a PA, right. And so, and the level up from that is a um, fees coordinator. And for that, you pretty much, um, this is back in the day when they still use tapes. And so you would just press and record video clips all day long. And it was funny because I came in thinking I was applying for the uh, video journalist, video journalist position, but they saw all of the experience they had. And so they bumped me up to um, fees coordinator. So I was like, oh, that's good. So, yeah. But 
you, did you ever think that you wanted to be in front of the camera or is it just always sort of producing behind the camera? Yeah, at that point in, um, yeah, that point in my life, I've all, I always wanted to um, just be behind the camera because as anyone knows, like the producer has like the most control. Um, yeah, I never thought of being in front at all. It's just something that didn't cross your mind, right? Yeah, it, it didn't because, you know, for, because not, yeah, someone like me, like, you know, I didn't think I looked like the people they would hire, you know, who were, you know, white, who were, you know, everything, not me. So. Wow. That, so that was actually going on in your mind. You're like, I don't want to be in front of the camera because I just don't look like that. Or, or it, it's like, or you're just like, not, I'm not built for that. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both, you know, like they're, you know, looking for like a bubbly personality and like, and, you know, I consider myself more, you know, for lack of a better word, like more um, in my head, like just more introverted and more, you know, yeah, not an extrovert at all. So yeah, quiet and not like really mm -hmm. like on, on air or on screen personality. Yeah, but now I feel like that I feel the trend has moved towards more, you know, not like, hey, well, you know, it moves towards more relatable, like people who are, you know, a little more serious. And so that kind of like, that is what kind of like changed it for me. So that I didn't have to be this like bubbly, perky personality. Nothing, not that there's nothing wrong with that, but that just, you know, was not me. So you're saying it's more like, now it's more authentic like you they just want somebody genuine but let me ask you this when did that change when did you start thinking differently because was there a trigger mm -hmm. in the cnn space or the tv space that you're like oh that person i can be like that um i think it was more out of like necessity like you know i wanted to do all these projects but i don't have like the um you know the budget or the resources to hire someone on air so you know what i'm i'm just gonna do it myself so so that's where that came out of was just yeah necessity and you know the tide changing towards more like you know like someone like anthony bourdain you know he's not bubbly he's not like perky like he's kind of snarky and more intellectual and people um gravitated towards that so how long were you at cnn for um, I was there for a little over a decade. So I spent, yeah, I would say I spent really most of my career there. So it's a long time. Yeah. It's a long time for anybody to stay at any company like that these days. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, but even though I was there for 10 years, it wasn't like I stayed in the same position, you know, like I was a feeds coordinator for maybe six months and they kind of made that position so horrible that like you, if you were, you know, productive, like you wanted to get out of that position because it was an entry level position. And so they were really looking for people who were like hungry and who wanted to like move out and find ways to like move up. And so I was just there for like six months. And then there was another position called media coordinator, like another step up the rung, you know, and was there for six, six months. And then I was an associate producer um, in the creative marketing group for, um, for, for around like three years and then became a producer uh, by like my late twenties. And so that's kind of, the traje trajectory at CNN, like they have certain steps. Okay, so you yeah. are an associate producer, you said for three years, right? Yeah, and oh, then and then I moved up to producer, yeah. and then to senior producer. So. Okay, so I wanna know, cause I've never talked to anybody who was an associate producer, a producer, and then a senior producer. Like what are the three differences, like in the mm -hmm. stratas, right? Like as an associate producer, yeah. what, what does that entail? What is that different from being a producer? And then what is a producer different being a senior producer? Yeah, so I so with um, associate producer, it's mostly really um, helping out, um, you know, the like next level being to, the producer. Like, I'm like I was still doing producing, you know, I was still writing and I was still um, 
putting packages together and, you know, and supervising edits and everything. And um, just edit level of responsibilities, you know, because, you know, as an associate producer, if I get in trouble for something, then, you know, the person it would person who would get in trouble is the producer. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that level of responsibility and accountability comes with, you know, each rung up the ladder, mostly, you know, so and by the, oh, go ahead. the work, you're basically doing the work, but not really taking the hit for the responsibility. Yeah. And getting paid less too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then as an associate producer, what sort of segments were you producing at the time? Um, so I was so with the creative marketing group, like they were, they did a lot of the creative for um, CNN, whether it was branded content or commercials or promos. And so I did a lot of the um, what's called interstitials, which is the um, daily promos where tonight on Larry King Live, we have blah, 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 blah. And so that was, um, yeah, for associate producer. And then with producer, you would move more into the bigger projects like the launch campaigns for say or Larry King Live or um, Anthony Bourdain. So you came up with, you know, the branding message for it and um, kind of the project management of, you know, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. And then the senior producer. And then with the senior producer, it was uh, more creative direction. So um, like your vision, it kind of trickles down to um, for everyone else to um, follow the follow this it. Sounds, so. This sounds like um, um, you were doing it. It was like more of the promo side. But did you ever get into producing like actual new segments or um, you know stuff like Anthony Bourdain's actual like him going to places to to shoot? Yeah, that's something I've always wanted to do, but it's such like a different beast itself, you know, and um, and I feel like not the things that I'm doing now is more like that. Yeah. But the fact that I have that background in like the marketing and promoting, like I can like promote the hell out of something, you know, as opposed to someone who was who is just, uh, you know, a producer in the show, they wouldn't really like understand like what would compel like an audience to like watch it so i feel like i have you know so much more to offer now so yeah. because of that i can imagine like if you know what people are wanting to watch you can actually mm -hmm. produce something that people want to watch yeah and then you can actually market the thing yeah. you want to watch yeah exactly what do you think made people want to watch something like bourdain um, I think I think it goes back to, you know, that authenticity, you know, he's not you know, fluff, you know, he is really interested in knowing about a culture and he is also like an amazing writer and so he has such like a distinct um, point of view, and he was, you know, sh showing people a different side of a of a community or a country that you normally don't see and i and you know up to that point a lot of like food media was that aspirational you know and he was more of like the nitty gritty and i think that's really that really brought in like a new audience who didn't want that fluff and who really wanted to um experience how life is in another country through food were there multiple people that CNN would groom or train or sort of process through the ranks that would become like a Bourdain? Like at any given time, did CNN do, you know, there's 10 guys mm -hmm. like Bourdain and then we just don't know about him until it like until they become like ripe or mature and then CNN just pushes them out. So is there like a training program or they just contractually find somebody at that level already and then they just bring them in? Um, I think like I, I can't speak too too much about like the talent, but from you know from what my own experience is, um, like take for example Anderson Cooper, you know, like he um, before like his watershed moment was Katrina, like that is what put him on the map. Um, 
would I would you say he was being like groomed for that type of you know mm. for that um not at all you know or like a Don Lemon like he just was a daily um news anchor and now he's such um a voice high, yeah a voice uh, uh, speaking out against you know injustice like that is a, that's almost kind of on their own initiative, you know. Um, so I, so I went. So I mean, CNN is always looking for talent, and it's. But you can't really um, predict that. You know, you don't have a crystal ball to see who is going to like rise to the occasion, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, because I mean, you have the rise of, you know, all of the police brutality, and Don Lemon gets his chance, and. Mm -hmm. Cooper with Katrina and he gets his shot. Um, yeah. Were there any Asian Americans or specifically any Vietnamese during those years that were sort of on their way up? Yeah, there was um, there was um, Betty Nguyen. Yeah, how... she is. Yeah, she was. I she worked when I was at CNN. She um, I think is was the first Asian first Vietnamese american a woman to um, be on cable as a news anchor and um she was very accessible and we uh, we actually knew each other and so she would um give me advice and everything when i was still like an associate producer and so yeah you know it's all about like helping the next generation. So I was, um, I don't know if she remembers me now, but um, I was really thankful for that, for her time and, you know, giving me advice. And, and if it was like, now that I'm, that I'm hearing and processing what you're saying, to go from a betting wing to a Don Lemon or Anderson Cooper, Betty would probably had to have step up into some situation, some world catastrophe or something, right? And then she would have to, kind of put her voice out there to really catapult it to the next level um i i i, I guess you could say that like i think for her her watershed moment that happened when um um i, I remember distinctly she was one of the few um journalists who gained access to uh, myanmar during like a time it had like a coup or an uprising or something you know so um yeah, it's all about, like, for me, I had a watershed moment, too, if I can share it. I so. would love to hear that. I was going to ask okay. you. Because <laughs> um, this is what, like, really um, put me on the map at CNN and, like, put me, like, on the fast track. Um, so I was still an associate producer at the time, and um, Anderson Cooper was doing a special for World Refugee Day. And so um, um, I found that out through like my supervisor. I was like, oh, whoa, that's cool. And I was like, I, I don't know if you know, but um, I'm a refugee. And then he was like, what? You don't look like a refugee. And, um, and, so, and so that kind of like started um, these wheels spinning in my head because, um, you know, just because I don't, because I think people, when they think of refugees, they have a very certain like image, you know, of like kids um, and families in these war torn countries. And, um, but then, you know, there is life after that, you know, and I'm kind of like a product of that. And so when, so th the project that I um, pitched to my um, boss at the time was um, I wanted to also highlight other CNN employees who used to be former refugees to show, you know, everyone that to show a different definition of what it means to be a refugee. And that's what so is so great about CNN is that it's such like a global company and it values all these different backgrounds. And so um, the people that I highlighted was uh, one woman who was a producer from um, Nigeria and another was a woman who um, family escaped the um, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia 
and another from an Eastern um, European company. And at the time, Rick Sanchez, his family escaped from um, Cuba, like he was a, a anchor at CNN. And so it really opened up people's eyes, you know, and I had to like pitch this up the um, up the ranks to uh, to these executive producers. So here I am, like an associate producer. I'm like 24 years old, like pitching to all these higher ups and they, um, you know, they get behind it and they become my advocates for the project. And so that was what really put me on the map. And like the next year, like I, I became a producer, like that was what I wanted. So, so yeah. So you're, you're this associate producer, you're doing your daily job. You have this idea because you were triggered in a way, in a good way by Anderson, mm -hmm. right? So you have this idea, you're like, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna write this stuff up and I'm gonna put it. But then how are you, like the executive producer that you pitch to, is it one person, three people? Is it different teams? How do you go about presenting within the company? Yeah, it's so I first um, pitched the idea to my uh, immediate supervisor, and then he um, and then we pitched it to his boss, which is kind of the, um, you know, the boss of the whole department. And she goes and with me in the room, like, because now she's my advocate. And that's so important is having advocates and so she's like hey i've got this you know up and coming superstar associate producer and we and she has a great idea and you know i want to share it with you and we think we should do it and so um and that's how it happened and then you have this and, idea yeah go ahead oh I, oh I was just going to say yeah it's just i think as a young person like it's so important to have advocates yeah. and yeah so you, you have it all written up and you go and you show these different teams and mm -hmm. you get it actually produced? Yeah, so this was a um, print campaign. And so this was um, where I produced the um, these like posters that would be shown all over the bureaus of CNN, like in, in, um, in the Beijing bureau and um, the London and Paris Bureau. So, yeah. yeah. And then, so um, did you have to get permission from the people that you were spotlighting? Did you have to go talk to them first? And you're like, oh, I have this idea. And then how did you even know that they were refugees? Um, I just through, you know, word of mouth, I would be like, hey, do you, you know, do you guys know any co-workers who used to be refugees? And from there, there, it was just like a snowball effect because it was, this was a project that everyone wanted to get on board with, you know, because it's, um, it's so different from what we normally do. And yeah, and yeah, that's what I just love about working at CNN, which is how international the um, employees were there, you know, and, and and as big as it was, it was still pretty um, tight, small. Yeah, 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 pretty small and tight. So I didn't have any problems finding um, subjects at all. What were some of the challenges and the difficulties of working for a company like CNN? I think I think one of the biggest one is that because it's such a big and global company is that you, you might feel as if you're like a small little cog or small, you know, just one part of a bigger machine. But I felt like with that project that um, one person can make a difference, you know, and be, make a huge difference. And um, so that's what I love about it that even that's such a big company and that even though you think like one person can't make an impact and they can yeah but what about the challenges no challenges um i i think yeah i think the same thing is that it's such a big company that you think you can't um make a uh, make a difference and i mean yeah yeah there were you know levels of bureaucracy and everything but i think at the end of the day like you know because we were so committed to you know reporting the news like you can't just 
you know, breaking news happens and you can't go through like 10 layers of tape to get the story on air, you know? And so the people who work there are like, you know, the best of the best. And, um, and what do you think of all of the sort of polarity of, you mm -hmm. know, like a CNN or, a, or a Fox and the branding and the sort of the differences in the direction that they take? If I feel since, you know, since I, since I've left, it's now more like a proliferation, you know, there's before it was just, you know, CNN, Fox News, NS, NBC, and there's so many more different platforms. It's not just television anymore. Um, people get their news from Twitter or Facebook now, you know, it's so segmented in a way that it wasn't before and that truth you know the idea of what is truth yeah. you know because there are the gate because there aren't like gatekeepers anymore you know so it's as you know i don't want to get into like politics but you know as the last election has shown is like we need accountability in how we get our news or else you know, because if people because because people see it out there they just assume that it's you know true yeah. and that's you know not the case what um what made you leave um it was more for um personal reasons i um i got married and um you know i think after like 10 years like i wanted to um also do projects that interest me and i was getting a little um like burnout out from the daily news cycle so yeah it sounds like a grind everybody i talk to in that business it sounds very difficult sometimes to be yeah especially with you know the big t word <laughs> <laughs> yeah say no more <laughs> um and then so when you made the decision to leave, did you have a plan? Did you like, okay, I'm, this is what I'm going to do next. And then a year later you planned to jump or did you just stop and then just went right into what you wanted to do? Um, I took, um, I like a sabbatical for my first year. Like, uh, so while I was working at CNN, I also, um, got my, um, MFA in poetry from NYU. And so um, when I left CNN, I um, ended, I, I spent, um, I focused on my MFA, graduated from that. And then um, right after graduation, I got a um, fellowship for poetry at um, Pepperdine University in Malibu for a summer. And so that was just kind of like a we, like a, like an, reaffirming that my life was probably was moving away from news and towards more of the creative side mm -hmm. you know and so um that and so when i was at the fellowship my um poetry mentor there um her name is nina alexander um sadly she like passed away but um you know, I remember telling her, like, you know, I love writing poetry, but I just feel like, you know, it needs to move forward somehow. Like, I feel like um, it shouldn't just be on the written word, written word. And so she introduced me to all these, like, short films that are based on poetry. And so that's where, that was where the impetus for, like, being, like, a filmmaker started to come into play like oh i can make you know these weird short films out of um, my favorite poetry and everything and so and so yeah so those were my first films are these like weird like avant-garde um that i hope no one will ever see so <laughs> well look i i need to i need to explore this whole poetry side because i i think i've read that that that's what you you went to new york for your mfa but that's like, mm -hmm. that's a huge life decision going from making money into something, an MFA, not making money. But what do you get? Like, what was the thought process to get an MFA in poetry? Um, I always like, you know, I was always 
like you know i like i was saying like in my earlier like life like i wanted to be like an artist i wanted to be creative and but you know but then you have you know having to make a living and so that took over you know took over my life was you know having a career and so that creativity side had to you know take a back seat and so I had the luxury of um being able to like take some time off you know I'm taking that year off and um pursuing that so. and that was a, a one-year program to get the MFA um in poetry no, the um the MFA was a two year program. Like it was a low residency. So, you, so while I was like working um, at CNN, I was still like pursuing it. And then when I left CNN, like then I graduated, and then got the um, fellowship. Okay, when I think about poetry or film or anything creative, I think of sometimes mm -hmm. I think of like there's a lot of structure in film. Uh, you could make the same argument with poetry that there's structure in my yes. head i don't see it because i i'm not i'm not it from that world the poet you know but how much structure really is there like what do you really what what is uh what is the difference between like spending let's say five years just like grinding it out writing poetry versus somebody who gets their mfa what is the difference in sort of the product yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, when their idea of poetry is like, oh, it's just, you know, there's really no structure to it. But, you know, like the nitty gritty of it, like even writing like one line that suddenly structure where like wherever you put punctuation, that's still considered structure, you know. So for me, I guess coming from that world, like I, it's absolutely like based on structure, even though it might, you know, and that's, I think it's done its job if, you know, people, if it's so effortless that it feels like there's no structure. So, yeah. I'm still trying <laughs> to process that. Yeah. I mean, there's like a whole thought process, you know, like, yeah, I think, you know, I think there's this, you know, idea of like poets who just, you know, write whatever comes out of their head, but there's so much like editing and so much, you know, rewriting that goes into um, creating poetry. Uh, this is a random question, but is there any sort of study um, alongside like, like, legit poetry and perhaps rap um during your pro uh, program at all you know like that's one of the one things that i um i feel is um lacking within you know um the study of poetry is that the idea of you know bringing in other medium because yeah like rap is based on rhymes and it's based on the musicality and um and you know i think with a lot of things that are that are having like having a reckoning right now like definitely the um the academic community the literary community is also having to like reevaluate like who gets to you know who gets to write these stories and who gets to be published and um yeah, and for a long time, you know, it it was very white, you know, but now it's um, there's opportunities for like people of color and for like spoken word is um, one thing that comes to mind, like of taking, you know, poetry and um, performance and putting it together. And I think there needs to be more of that or else, you know, poetry is going to be like a dying art form and again and that was what I wanted to do you know take the world of film and the world of poetry and for a new audience so. and merge the two mm -hmm. um, how often do you write poetry now sadly I focus so much time on like writing scripts now that I um don't um i haven't written like poetry in a long time but i will tell you this a lot of the best like tv writers do have a poetry background just because um 
poetry teaches you um, how, like the economy of words, like, you know, keep everything as tight as possible and to say so much and so little. And so I feel like everything that I've learned in poetry really helps with uh, my script writing. So. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Ocean Vuong. Oh, yeah. I had it like he I unfortunately never got a chance to meet him when I did in Paris and I'm kicking myself that I never did so well let's talk about that uh your your project with Paris um so how did it begin what in, what inspired your your documentary um so I think so for me I was a late bloomer to travel I didn't start Paris was the first city outside of no yeah the first european city that i traveled to and so and i and i think i've always had like a fascination and a love affair with paris like with my mfa it was um a low residency program which meant that you know um we would have workshops in um yeah workshops in paris like we would spend like two weeks for a winter residence and two weeks for a summer residence. And so I've been um, to Paris um, like eight, eight or nine times now. So not that that makes me a expert in any way, but you know, um, each time I would come to Paris, it wasn't, it wasn't as like a tourist, you know, it was as, you know, a student, as someone, you know, being immersed in that culture. And yeah, the first time I came to Paris, um, I was just as I was just so shocked that there was like a Vietnamese community there, you know, and that was so fascinating to me to have like pho in Paris and have it taste just as good and a bang me there too. I was, you know, my mind was like completely blown away because, you know, my background being from like Georgia, like I never even knew that they were like communities in other countries and and that stayed with me um every time so every time i would go to paris i would go to and um and it felt it felt um it felt like i was you know at home in a foreign place yeah. you know because i didn't speak french and not a lot of um people you know, spoke English. And then here I am able to be able to communicate in like Vietnamese to, you know, another Vietnamese person. And so that I, that was kind of um, when you're feeling like homesick, you know, so. So wait a minute, let me, let me get this straight. You go to Paris for the first time, right? And you really don't know the sort of the historical context of what Vietnamese people are doing there or whenever they got there, that there was even a community. But what did you do, like open up a, a restaurant guidebook or how did you discover that there was this community in Paris? It, I, I was just feeling homesick and I just looked, you know, on Yelp for like pho places just out of like, no, let's see if there's like Vietnamese food here. And because I mean, I, I knew that they are, you know, because of our history, you know, French colonialism and everything that there is a history. And so. But I, so I knew that there was some there there was a connection, and then it wasn't until I got to Paris, and I was like, oh, there's a there's a whole like district there, and that was really um, eye opening. Yeah, I have been um, talking to several older members of our Vietnamese community who've been in Paris since the fifties. They left it as young men, like way before the war. And uh, I've interviewed several of these men, and it is mind blowing to think that even before my parents were born, you know, they were, they had relationships mm -hmm. with, you know, Vietnam and, and France had, you know, they they were sending um, military personnel back to, to to France to train in the navy in the army, mm -hmm. in the military, and then they would bring them and post them back in Vietnam. And it would just be a completely French thing, you know? Yeah. And 
this existed for a long time um and obviously it led to you know a lot of you know conflicts that uh that produces <laughs> what was the modern you know uh, vietnam war but yeah in in the 50s it was it was a big group of, of of vietnamese students that went to 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 france and some of them never left yeah. yeah, and 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 I yeah, there's so many of those stories and more, and and I want to learn more about those, you know. And I can't wait until like COVID is over so that we can like start traveling again. Yeah, yeah. What inspired you to sort of um, hone in on the food and not some other aspect of the Vietnamese uh, French experience? Like I've always been a foodie growing up even like when I was you know a little girl in like South Georgia like I would look you know at PBS and I would look at, watch the travel and food channels and you know this was before like being a foodie was like a cool thing um, and I was fascinated with like truffles and caviar and so I it was because you know I being a lifelong foodie and um you know one of the people that I admired the most was Anthony Bourdain you know and the way that he told stories through food and um yeah all of that like I knew the story that I wanted to tell was through food because even in you know Vietnamese culture like food is such a big thing and it's around food that people really like open up and let their guard down and yeah so that's why I felt like this is you know the best way to tell these stories so you have this idea that's kind of like brewing in your mind right mm -hmm. and then you write a treatment or you write some description of this idea, but how does it go from like this idea to like this finished 15 minute short documentary? Yeah, I, I was prefaced by saying like, this is not how you go about making a documentary. <laughs> Because, yeah, you know, because coming from, you know, like CNN and making, you know, the longest thing I ever produced was, you know, a couple minutes. Yeah, going from like producing something that's a couple minutes to producing something that is, you know, like is 15 minutes is, it's kind of a stretch, you know. It, there, so there's that knowledge gap that I had to um, quickly learn because how you tell a story and, you know, a short amount of time is so different from how you tell a story. And, how, and how is it different? Um, it's, you know, with, um, with for, for example, like doing commercial, it's like finding that little uh, nugget and it's like bang, 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 you know, but with something, you know, a longer piece, you get to really um, fill it up with space. And for me, that was the challenge of like, how do, you know, I feel, fill it up. And um, yeah, so I didn't, I mean, I did write like a treatment and, and, I, and I did write like a rough script just because, yeah, you still have to have like a roadmap to figure out what you want to shoot. And I already had um, interview questions and I already had interview subjects in mind. And so I think what, you know, documentary, it's more of um really the story doesn't happen until you know the camera really starts rolling because you don't really know you know what their stories are i mean you might have like a preconceived notion of like what the story is but um i think it's that um i think it's that element of discovery that um is really different from like for documentary as opposed to like a traditional film is having that spontaneity to keep you know the camera rolling for these unexpected but like magical moments that right. you didn't even realize were going to happen did you come in, did you come into the project with sort of like a thesis an idea that you wanted to kind of talk about or were you just like all right let me just go in and shoot a bunch of uh restaurant owners and see where the story unfolds mm -hmm. Um, I think my overall thesis was that I really wanted to like highlight um, a community that hasn't really that 
you know, because I'm Vietnamese, because we're Vietnamese that we would, that we seek out, but like someone who's like an American tourist, like would not have any idea. So it was more of really, you know, highlighting their stories. And, um, and I think it was more of just, you know, just having an overarching theme, but I just wanted to, you know, discover what was out there, which it can be a good and a bad thing, you know, if you're too unstructured, but um, yeah, it, and, you know, because this was also my like first documentary, I had no idea what I was doing. So. <laughs> well, some idea of it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, when you when you say that, what do you mean by that? Like you had no idea. Like what didn't you know that you think you should have known going in? You know, like that's something that I should have had more confidence in. You know, like I have this background of producing at CNN for like over ten years. Like I know what I'm doing. You know, but it's just you know the idea of you know that label of like filmmaker of director it feels so like mythical it feels like it it belongs to somebody else you know and I and maybe it's you know because I suffer suffer from imposter syndrome a lot and so I never think of myself as like oh I'm good I'm good enough to be labeled this yeah so that happens with I think that happens with a lot of um a lot of us in the sort of creative fields, right? It's just part of it. Mm -hmm. And and I would venture to say that a lot of people do have it. Um, and then there are people that don't have it. You know, there's the guys that don't have mm -hmm. it, but then there are most of that do have it. And I can't speak for the people that have it, but I can speak for the people, I can speak for the people who, who have imposter syndrome like me. And what I've learned over the years is Imposter syndrome sometimes is beneficial because it helps puts us in check. Sort of like, mm, okay, mm -hmm. you better double check your shit and make sure like whatever you're putting out is quality and just go over it over and over and over and over again. So then when you do put it out, you know, you've done your best to kind of put that yeah. work out. Um, and then if you don't have a syndrome, you might just like throw I'm good. I'm like, I'm, you know, you're so confident. You're like, ah, I'm good. And you don't check it. And that could be a problem mm -hmm. too. So, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at it, you know? Yeah. I I've embraced it because I'm yeah, definitely on that, uh, imposter syndrome, uh, <laughs> bus I'm on it and I deal with it a lot. I deal with it uh, daily in my life. You know, am I doing the right thing? Am I creatively putting out something that's quality? It's, it's always there. Mm -hmm. How did you find um, the subjects that were in your documentary? Yeah, a lot of it was, um, you know, I only, so it's, it's funny, like, like my husband was telling me, like, he was going to Paris, like, in a month. And then that was when I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go shoot a documentary in a month, you know? <laughs> And so I only had like really a month of um, pre-planning for everything. <laughs> so that meant, you know, like. I'm going to go shoot a documentary in a month. Like he's like, I'm going to go in a month. And you're like, I'm going to go in a month. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this would be like the perfect opportunity to like shoot. But, but again, like that, you know, the idea of it was always like in the back of my mind. And like, oh, this is an opportunity that's just presented itself. You know, yeah. And so I only had the yeah. So I had like a month of um, prep to find um, crew, find my find my DP, find like a fixer there, um, find like an audio person, like pretty much like putting together a crew, you know, remotely, and also looking for subjects remotely and and being an outsider you know and not knowing like um you know, not really knowing anyone there and for the subjects it was mostly um like googling um yeah googling um Vietnamese restaurants and just reaching out and be like hey do you can I shoot can I tell your story um yeah most of them I met 
was just through Googling and making a cold email introduction and having them say yes. Wow. And ultimately, did you get the things that you wanted to get? Did you did the experience turn out the way you had imagined it? Um, I think for the most part, it it did. Like I, I think if things that like if I could go back, um, do differently is probably uh, my interview style. Like at this point, I was like, oh, I'm Anthony Bourdain. I'm just gonna like shoot it with my interview subject, and we're just gonna like have a conversation over a meal. <laughs> wait, so wait. And I mean it. Was that harder to pull off than what you had imagined, being like a Bourdain? Well, what what I should have done was um, like actually just sit down and like interview them. So then I would have like coverage, like so much more coverage than you know, as opposed to just um, interviewing them over a meal. So that's I think that's the main thing, like moving forward to always just like do like a one-on-one -on -one interview and then um, do the other stuff, so. Got it. But yeah, but I was like, I'm oh, Anthony Morty. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, in, okay, I think in your mind, you were like, okay, let me pull this off like Bourdain, right? But then you get there and you turn the camera yeah. on and it rolls and you realize, okay, I'm not Bourdain, but then, <laughs> what I, I think what in your mind and when in your mind did you go okay this is a lot harder than it looks um I, I get we, because we had such like um we only had like five days of shooting and so there was no time to like really pre-interview and so pretty much when we got there we set up everything was like you know bam we're doing the interview as opposed to like really having time to do several interviews, you know, and, and really knowing, you know, all these amazing like people a little more intimately, you know, so. But I feel like what, I, oh, but I feel like I was still able to like draw out stories from them. So, do you think so I mean, yeah, it wasn't a, hmm? Do you think Bourdain gets more time? Yeah, like he, he's, yeah. You know, I mean, they would like pre-interview the sub, you know, the subjects and everything so that he kind of ha already has like an idea of what, you know, talking points mm -hmm. and everything. Um, they would, yeah, they, I mean, they would spend hours lighting, you know, before they even filmed. So it was... You know, even though like it looks like, oh, they just came in and came out, but literally, you know, like that, yeah. because the production value was so high, like, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's like everything's on the fly, you know, oh, like we just found something or we just got the yeah. call and hey, we're going to head out to that village. Yeah, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you spend five days to shoot this, uh, this documentary and um, you finish it, mm -hmm. you go back and you edit it and what happens after that okay so this is where like the imposter syndrome comes in again because i feel like i'm such a failure that everything i shot is horrible that i don't look at the footage for at least a couple months hmm. because i i don't you know because yeah because you know that imposter syndrome you're like oh I don't want to look at it because I know, you know, the footage is going to suck. And so to avoid feeling that, I just, you know, but luckily I have like accountability partners who are like, come on, Hugh, it's not that bad. Just look at the footage, put it together, you know. And this is again where like, um, so I look at the footage and I'm like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> And then, you know, when it comes time to edit it, like I, um, you know, one of the first things you should have is like a team in place and I don't have a team in place. So I'm scrambling to look for an editor and, um, and like one of the main things is like, because a lot of these interviews are in Vietnamese and because, you know, 
this is, you know, for us, by us, like we should have, you know, an editor who's Vietnamese. And so um, that's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. But luckily I um, was, um, I found, well, a, so the editor is Richard Van, who is like in his own right, is also an amazing like filmmaker. And um, I worked on one of his uh, short films as an executive producer. And like, coincidentally, it's also called My Name Hugh, but he didn't name it because I was an executive producer. But, and so, and I was telling him like, hey, do you know of any like editor who's Vietnamese? And he was like, I am, I can do it for you. And I was like, oh, you know, Sarah did for me, great. You know, someone I know and trust and who has like a great vision um, and, creative style and so we worked together for um, about six months editing the film which is like way too long for like a 15 minute right. <laughs> but again imposter syndrome and like I put it off I don't want to look at it because I think it's going to suck um so but you know because um we just wanted to like put something together as quickly as possible, you know? So that's why it's like 15 minutes, but we have so much more like footage. And so I want to um, create um, a director's cut that is um, 22, 23, you know, broadcast length because that's where I kind of want, um, want it to go next is to get it on like PBS or um, somewhere on air. So. Got it. Did you ever have to go back to Paris for pickup shots or anything? Luckily, no. But but then that wasn't you know that was wasn't an option. You know what you what I have is what I have to work with. So right, right. And then now, how how would people watch this? How did it get out into the? Has it gotten out to the world to see? Um. So first, we are um still in the. Um, film festival stage so that's why it's not like readily available yet um, like the first screening for it was at the um, Ludwig, um community center and they've been so um, instrumental in helping um, support the film you know because this is for you know the Vietnamese community and to have like Ludwig behind it is um, is so like humbling and um I'm very grateful for that too. When, so. when did you release it to um Bao is it Bao Mm-hmm. Um that was um in twenty nineteen. Yeah, twenty nineteen was when it had its screening, initial screening with Mulevic, and then like the twenty twenty last year was when it um got into like the different festivals, like all the world and but because of the pandemic, um I wasn't able to like attend any of the film screenings. Not even the one in, you know, in LA or the um, Los Angeles Pacific Asian American. That one like was so dear to my heart because, you know, it's right in our hometown and I really wanted, I wish the festival was, you know, in person as opposed to virtual. Did you submit it to the Vietnamese Film Festival? Um, I did, but, you know, because of the pandemic, um, they postponed it for 2020 and, um, Hopefully, we'll have like another one for. Yeah. they'll come. They're coming back for twenty twenty one. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. we can all see it at the uh, Vietnamese Film Festival this year, twenty twenty one. Hopefully, if I if it gets selected, we'll see. So exciting. Can't That's promise exciting. anything. Yeah. Why? Why did you just decide to make like in the beginning? Why did you think like oh I'll just make a short one instead of like a a full long one like a feature length one. Um, I, I think it's because I wanted to, um, you know, baby steps. Like first I was, you know, producing content that was a couple minutes and now this is longer. And then I think, you know, that being, you know, 20, 25 minutes. So I wanted to do everything kind of like in baby steps, but, you know, yeah. But like in hindsight, uh, I should have just made it, you know, broadcasting. So you've grown up in Georgia You've been living in LA for a while. You've uh, been to Paris and the Vietnamese um, district. Have you been back to Vietnam yet? 
And if so, what was that like? Yeah, that is the number one place that I want to go to, um, you know, once the pandemic is over and I want to have a film crew with me and um, document that experience. And I really want to um, go back with my parents because they haven't been back in 40 years, you know, and to just get their reaction and how, you know, they feel about going back to so. are, they, are they open to it um you know it's 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 kind of like they are open to it but you know they've been away so long like i think it's going to be like a culture shock for them there's still so much for them to also unpack you know all the things that they, they left behind that they would have to, you know, confront and everything. So, so, so it's going to be like very, um, yeah, it's, it's so much to unpack for every, everyone. So, yeah. Um, now, when you think about the sort of like people from Vietnamese, from Georgia, from LA, from, Paris, do you see any similarities and differences in the people, in the Vietnamese people? Um, yeah, I think there there is a big a big difference in terms of um, yeah. I'm gonna have to unpack this one, like, like so for like the Vietnamese community in Georgia because. Um, I really didn't come. I didn't really didn't have a community in Georgia. The only one I could talk about is kind of like the one in Atlanta. And for that, it was mostly um, from my, like I wasn't really immersed in that um, Vietnamese community in Georgia either. If anything, it was through the food mostly. And then in um, LA, of course, there's Little Saigon. And for me, um, because of like Nui Vic, um, I, I feel like I'm closer to um, that Vietnamese community. But there's still a lot of struggle of my identity because I don't speak, you know, as fluent Vietnamese as someone who grew up and I don't speak I don't write the language like it uh, it feels like I'm not Vietnamese enough for Orange County you know yeah no, I don't know no I get it I that's a, a very fair self-assessment you know I think that um language is a bridge into another you know it's a cliche mm -hmm. but it's a bridge into another world and um if you don't speak that language, it's very tough to navigate culturally in that that world, that universe. So I, I completely get it. And there's levels to all of this too. There's like, you know, yeah. there's levels. There's just not like, you know, it's just not like either you got it or you don't, but in between you either have it or you don't, there's like levels inside of it as well. There's nuances yeah. to it that, um, yeah that uh i'm learning every day that it's it's deep yeah and for the community in paris i think coincidentally i feel the most welcome there just because um you know compared to like the communities in georgia and in Lourdes, saigon because it's such a smaller pocket like it it feels more welcoming because there's so little of you that when you like see someone who who's like you it's like oh i found like another cousin another you know family member so it's very like you know welcoming and come in as opposed to you know as, as opposed to a place where it's such a bigger community you know yeah i think that there's a, a, a good point it's um Orange County has a certain, um, uh, you know, there's a strength in numbers and in the strength in numbers, they don't really think that, you know, that there's people like who have Vietnamese blood who really can't speak it. And then if you can't speak it, there's no forgiveness for that. Right. There's just like, yeah. don't, I mean, it's just human nature. You know, it's like they won't have sort of this empathy for somebody who comes from, I mean, basically outside of the community. Right. 
um, because we all, uh, you know, if you're from Orange County, I'm not. I'm from. I grew up in Koreatown, but um, Koreatown in L.A. But I, I've spent my whole life going. You know, obviously, family mm-hmm. and friends in Orange County and partying in Orange County as a, as a young man. That there's a, a certain um, expectation, uh, cultural expectation, and um, I think Paris might be like Vietnamese, French, French Vietnamese would be more sort of inclined to be more open and curious mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. A, a vietnamese american right and yeah. so there's like sort of that cushion that you know that space in between our cultures that will allow for them to because every time i met somebody from from france there's like a, a mutual sort of curiosity and interest um whereas like somebody in oc there's this sort of like you know there's just again there's this identity that's already baked into you know 40 something years of a community down there that's uh you know it's it's a it's a tight community too yeah yeah so what's next for you yeah so i so one of it is i want to you know turn um the short film into like broadcasting and get it on like a pbs or streaming um i'm working on well, I'm developing a, another documentary that's um, also based on um, based on food and Vietnamese culture. I really want to do something with um, fish sauce for some reason. Like I feel like for some reason that's what my do- that next documentary is beyond because I feel like it's so like misunderstood, especially with like you know, Western palettes, they see it as only this like one note. Oh, it's stinky. And I want to like change that perception. Like, why can't it be as uh, nuanced as when people talk about olive oil, when people talk about wine, because there's, you know, because the terroir uh, plays such a big um, part in it. So that's um, one that I'm developing. And I'm also getting into um, developing um, TV shows I've written um, several pilots and um, hoping to get those um, produced, Uh, you know, because now is such a big time for, you know, Asian American voices. Like I feel like finally the doors are opening up and we have so many, well, I have so many stories to tell that, you know, that's for me the natural progression is to get, um, is going to television again. So. Yeah, that fish sauce um, thing is interesting because because um, you brought up olive oil and you brought up um, what did you just bring up? You brought up all, two Italian things. Uh, you said you brought wine. Up and wine, both sort of um, beautiful in Italian um, uh, culture. And why can't fish sauce be, you know, a normative? thing that we find beauty in 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 the world um especially in the, my in the united states right mm-hmm. a bunch of my creative friends were talking about this uh, the other day uh why is it that when we hear broken vietnamese in english or is a broken english coming from a vietnamese person that it's not as beautiful or it's not beautiful at all it's kind of repulsive by the mm-hmm. mainstream why is that the situation but when you hear a british or a italian or french Mm -hmm. english it it's beautiful it's it's romantic right Mm. we got to make that normative we have to make that a normal thing uh in the world and it's not just in the in the united states it's like is it something inherent in our tonal language that makes it not pretty? Is it something inherent in the fish sauce that's stinky? Like, what is the properties of these things that we're talking about that makes it not as attractive as in a, mm-hmm. the Italian culture? Well, I think a big part of it is how it's like portrayed in the media, you know, and it's always through like you know, a Western lens and a Western gaze, you know, like when you have, when you hear someone with like a French, French accent speaking English, it's also, it's always some like sexy, hot person. But then when you hear like, yeah, the broken English of, you know, of, of an Asian person, like it's, 
someone who, you know, isn't attractive is someone who's like a caricature. Yeah. And yeah, and I think that has a main thing too. And also, you know, it's been even the self, you know, hatred has been instilled within us, you know, like, yeah, you know, growing up in Western society, like, where these are the images that we're confronted in and you, you know, internalize that. And it's time we, you know, took pride in that and yeah, and make it and normalize it. You know, what's sad is I don't know in our lifetime if we're going to be able to normalize it for ourselves. I'm not even talking about for the public, like the mainstream public. Can we normalize it just for ourselves? Because that is probably the most important thing. We're beating the drums like normalize it, normalize it, make stinky, make make fish sauce not stinky, make uh, our tonal tona, tonality beautiful. You know, but we don't even believe it sometimes, right? It's something that we are not confident that fish sauce is not stinky or whatever. So the way I look at it is this: my wife is Taiwanese and she grew up a lot of spent a lot of years she was born in the u.s but she spent a lot of the years of her formative years in elementary high school mm -hmm. in taiwan and it's it's a it's um it's a blessing for her because she doesn't have the baggage that we vietnamese americans have mm -hmm. and the other it, other another point is there are kids now that are from vietnam who came in the mid 2015s or 2018 or 2010 and they came over here as um um made you help which is international students come over here and they stay here and they work here and they're professionals here become architects they become marketing professionals they become these mm -hmm. professionals in the united states they don't have the same baggage that we do and then they stay here for a little bit longer and they begin to accumulate the baggage mm -hmm. so it's like we have to like start believing it and we have to start marketing the beauty and it starts with projects like because you spotlight the beauty of ourselves no matter where we are we're in paris and it's beautiful mm -hmm. because being in paris it's that's a beautiful romantic whatever you know context is yeah. it's a beautiful place but hey we're able to be there and we are able to create beauty there and so we get to bring that back to the united states we get to portray that so fuck the imposter syndrome you know you're doing a great <laughs> job you know and i say that because i i'm trying to tell myself that too constantly right i'm as a creative yeah. and somebody who believes in in normalizing sort of our the beauty of our our journey um is something that i i i i want to i want to push with this podcast the vietnamese yeah and i think you're like doing an amazing job and like yeah we need more more of us you know yeah there, there's a there's a, a movement that's that's happening now um hugh thank you so much i've had a a wonderful oh you still the last question i i'm getting there oh <laughs> <laughs> thank you for reminding me i i was gonna wrap it all up but hey i i appreciate that i appreciate that <laughs> So that means that it was brewing in your mind, right? Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. I was wrapping it up and I was going to go, hey, thank you so much. And then the last thing is, you know, okay, perfect. So the last thing that that I want to talk after like talking to you about all these topics today, what does the how is the evolution of being Vietnamese? What does it mean to you today? And has it been an evolution for you or do you think it's sort of the same you've been the same sort of vietnamese person that you've always been yeah i think one thing that i really took away from uh from this documentary and it was it was really clear with the um with the young people is that there is so many ways to be vietnamese and that it can be fluid you know it is not this static thing like the thing that the young people would tell me is you know when they're with french people they feel more french than vietnamese but you know when they're with vietnamese people they feel more vietnamese than french 
And they were perfectly fine with that. You know, there's no reason to feel ashamed about it at all. And that, yeah, that idea of fluidity. And I think that's something that, you know, us living in the U.S., or it feels like we view identity too much as black or white. You know, yeah. either we're we are Vietnamese and we can speak speak it and we can write it. That's how we know we're Vietnamese. And as opposed to, you know, I might not speak as fluently and I might not write it or read it, but you know what? I still am Vietnamese no matter what, you know, it's my own personal perception of what I want to be. So yeah, so that's what I took away from the documentary and from like this whole conversation is that, you know, there is so many different ways to be Vietnamese and that it is fluid and it's really how you view it as opposed to external factors, you know, imposing their limitations on your own identity. I look forward to the next few years of the work that you put out. Thank you. And we let's definitely, you know, keep in touch. And I want to learn more about what you do too and see if there's some type of like synergy involved. So Yes, I'm sure there is. There's um there's a, a big group of creative uh people in LA. I'm sure you know a lot of them, but um I look forward to the stories that you'll be putting out because it seems that you have sort of this big curiosity for you know your own you know identity and where you're going to who you're going to become through the stories that you tell so we look forward to that thank you thank you for having me wonderful um and then hopefully we can catch up you know when you have another project coming out yeah thank you so much for your time today and uh we'll talk soon okay